Mary Anderson. I am the Associate Dean of Faculty Success and Research in the College of Humanities and the Arts. Um, I am so happy to welcome you all to the first University Scholar Series of the spring semester. Provost Vin Del Casino sends us his best wishes. He is unable to be here today, but I am delighted to have the opportunity to welcome today's scholar, Ben Don. Before we get started with our program, I would like first to acknowledge the land on which we stand. When we gather at San Jose State University, we gather on the ethno-historic tribal territory of the Tamian Ohlone, who were the direct ancestors of the lineages enrolled in the Mawekma Ohlone tribe and who were missionized into missions Santa Clara, San Jose, and Dolores. The land on which San Jose State University is established was and continues to be of significance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. We also recognize that the ancestors of the Muwekma Ohlone constructed and maintained the three Bay Area missions. Our campus extends to surrounding areas that held a Tupintoc, a traditional roundhouse once located at the historic Lope Iniegos land grant rancho Posolmi y Positas de las Animas, and also Marcelo Pio and Cristobal's land grant rancho Ulistac, which were places of celebration and religious ceremonies, as well as nearby ancestral heritage shell mounds that served as the tribe's traditional cemetery sites and, and territorial monuments. San Jose State University also desires to honor the military service of the Muwekma men and women who have honorably served overseas during World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Iraq, and who are still serving in the United States Armed Forces today. I would now like to welcome our online guests. Please keep in mind that closed captions are available and that this webinar is being recorded. If you have questions, we ask that you please use the Q&A feature on Zoom. The chat will be monitored and at the end of the presentation, we will take questions from the audience gathered here and also the Zoom room. I would also like to thank our sponsors for today, the Office of the Provost, Division of Research and Innovation, Department of Art and Art History, and the wonderful SJSU King Library. A huge thank to all, thanks to all the staff who organized the series to make it the success that it is. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Ben Don, Professor Don is an alumnus of San Jose State University where he earned his BFA. He went on to earn his Master of Fine Arts from Stanford and through his careful attention to matters of vision and visuality and his innovative approach to creating expressive art through the medium of photography, he has emerged as an artist of national importance. Professor Don's work investigates his Vietnamese heritage and questions of identity and belonging more broadly. As he journeys through the materials and images of the past, he creates art that engages our collective memory of war, community, place, nation, and family. Professor Don's photographs are an invitation to alternative paradigms of seeing, an invocation of questions around the relationship between sight, knowledge, and experience. His techniques are born out of his unique invention of a chlorophyll printing process in which photographic images appear to be embedded in leaves through the action of photosynthesis. Subsequent bodies of work have focused on 19th century photographic processes, applying them in an investigation of battlefield landscapes and contemporary memorials. His National Park series daguerreotypes celebrated the United States National Park System during its anniversary year. His work is in the permanent collections of the National Gallery of Art, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the De Young Museum, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Center of Creative for Creative Photography, the George Eastman Museum, and many others. He received the 2010 Eureka Fellowship 
from the Fleisch Hacker Foundation. And in 2012, he was a featured artist at the 18th Biennale of Sydney in Australia. He is represented by major galleries in San Francisco and Phoenix. We are so fortunate that he teaches photography right here at San Jose State University. Today, we will get to hear about his work, past, present, and future. Please welcome Ben. Okay, well, thank you so much. As we uh, switch slide deck here. Okay, and let me get rid of it. Is that okay to get rid of it? Got it. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Mary, for this wonderful introduction. And thank you for the Office of the Provost for, um, for, for sponsoring and including me in the Spring University Scholar Series. So I had been photographing for most of my life. When I picked up a camera in the fifth grade, I knew photography allowed me to examine my life. To photograph is to archive. Photography is a relationship to the present moment. And, the, and at the click of the shutter, that present moment is now the past. And there are many reasons to take pictures. One of the most urgent is for the future generation to look back in time. Photography is unique as a tool for creative expression that allow us to time travel. Photographers want those in the future to remember the past. We can also consider photographers crucial role in society as cultural producer and memorialist. The Vietnamese Buddhist monk and peace activist Thich Nhat Hanh published his last book at home in the world at the age of 92. He wrote, mindfulness must be engaged. Once we see that something must be done, we must take action. Seeing and action go together. Otherwise, what's the point in seeing? And I wanna emphasize that question, what is the point in seeing? So artists see, we are the eyes of culture. We look and we transform what we see into works of art. In my talk today, I will also be discussing war, refugees, and resettlement. Just this week, the, the United Nations Security Council declared a ceasefire in Gaza after the U.S. abstained. There's nothing good to come from a war on innocent civilians of Gaza. The Geneva Convention forbid collective punishment. Let me click for it. Okay, here we go. Uh, Grow up in San Jose on Santa Clara Street, I watch hours of Vietnam War movies in my parents' TV repair shop. My family came to the U.S. as war refugees from Vietnam when I was two years old, and my parents didn't discuss much of their experience of the Vietnam War. It was like it happened, the South became communist, and we left to find a better life. But as a kid, I continued to wonder about the war. It was not something that was hidden from me. Vietnam movies were popular in the 1980s and, his, and history books detailing the war were published in volume set, which one could own like a row of encyclopedia books. Topics about the Vietnam War became a favorite subject and soon followed the merchandising. So I grew up surrounding myself with the topics of war, and I witnessed the horrific image of a war on the land and body. Vietnam for me was a lush green landscape torn apart by bombs. When I became an art student at SJSU, my pondering of the Vietnam War legacy deepened. I started collecting cultural materials such, um, such as Life magazine, to help me understand what people who lived through the 1960 witnessed. I also ha have to credit an Asian American study minor with opening my eyes to Asian American history. In college, I had a history for the first time. And once you know your history, you're in power. And many of these historical images inspired this series called Immortality, the remnants of the Vietnam and American War. Immortality is the ability to live forever, eternal life. Remnants is the surviving trace. And in Vietnam, they refer to the Vietnam War. 
And using the picture I found in my research about the Vietnam War, I printed them onto leaves by using the light sensitive property of the chlorophylls within the, the leaves itself. I thought, what if the plants could witness these horrific events? What would they remember? What would they say? And how could they teach us? We learn in school that matters is composed of ele elements of of the various, um, sorry, matter is composed of atoms of the various element. That is, atoms rearrange themselves according to the law of nature. All those atoms that compose us carry memories that reach back to the beginning of time. They have been involved in many conflicts before the Vietnam War. This body work deals with an idea I call elemental transmigration, the decomposition of matters into other forms. The war became part of the landscape and nature remembered the traumas in the elements that composed the landscape. In 2010, I had an exhibit at Mills College Art Museum called Collecting Memories. In Collecting Memories, I explored the idea that memories exist in objects like the artifacts left at the memorial site. And what comes with memories is the ability to imagine Every time we remember, we use our imagination to recall a moment in the past and how we see that moment relates to our present state. So memories and imagination, imaginations are blend to tell stories that connects our history and past to the present moment and help us imagine what the future could be like. This installation is called Military Foliage. Printed on each leaf is a camouflage pattern from different military organization. I imagine if there is no end to war, will plants evolve into these patterns of war as if the plants have the memories of the soldiers taking over their habitat. I know camouflage is necessary for military conflict. Without it, soldiers wouldn't be able to hide in the landscape. But there's something much more troubling to wearing camouflage that we rather not think about is the possibility of death. When one wears this uniform, one already becomes part of the landscape, stepping into the void and becoming the land itself. Since my undergrad years at SJSU, I have been using eBay to find cultural materials that can further my art projects, I have become a collector of historical artifacts. These artifacts for collecting memories are public, such as newspaper clipping, and private, as the, pres as the personal photographs soldiers carry into the landscape. Each of these artifacts is embedded with memories, and they can recall memories for viewers especially at Mills College, where different generations come together to share ideas. And I witness viewers sharing their stories with one, an one another. And it accomplished one of my main goals in an art installation, a place for conversation and contemplation. Next year, we will mark the 50th anniversary of the end of the Vietnam War. In the Vietnamese American community here in San Jose, it, April, 30th, 1975 is known as the fall of Saigon. And more recently, it is called Black April, a day to lament and reflect. At the end of the Vietnam War, hundreds of thousands of refugees fled the impeded communism regime. More people from Laos and Cambodia follow as these countries experienced communism takeover in the devastated aftermath of the Vietnam War the Cambodian Vietnamese War and the Cambodian Genocide. These video clips are from a VHS tape given to me by a photojournalist named Jim Jensemer, who documented the plaque of Vietnamese boat people in 1987 in his book, Pain and Grace, A Journey Through Vietnam. So to tell the story, I had to look into my family's archives. In college, I found this wall aside portraits of my mother who was commissioned to help my mom find a husband and resulted in my parents' arranged marriage. The translation is a lonely person on a boat. 
And little did my mother knew at that time, know at that time that the, the Cambodian man she was going to marry had the wild idea of taking the family on a boat to flee the takeover of South Vietnam by the North. It's we arrived at Pula Pidao refugee camp on November 6, 1978, and were one of the first groups of boat people. These photographs were taken at Pula Pidao while, while we waited for asylum. Malaysia, Thailand, Hong Kong, the Philippines, and Singapore have been considered first asylum countries. Life continued in the refugee camp as people waited for a second asylum country to accept them. On September 12, 1979, the U.S. Embassy granted my family asylum. Partly due to my father's technical skills, we found our ways to the United States. Over the summer of 2002, uh, as I was preparing for graduate school, I proposed to my mom that we visit Pulipi Down, the site of an abandoned Southeast Asian refugee camp. This photo depicts refugees arriving at Pulipi Down Island after being rescued. Today, Pulipi Down is not a refugee camp anymore. It is an abandoned site. My mother and I found remnants of a forgotten community. Pulley Pidown officially opened as a refugee camp in 1978 with 121 Vietnamese refugees. A year later, that number grew to 40,000 Cambodian, Laotian, and Vietnamese refugees crowded into the area of the size of a football field. I made this portrait of my mom on the beach holding an immigration document that allowed us to enter the United States as refugees. Traveling with her was quite a fantastic experience. She was the one who remembered the event. I was only a baby at that time. And being on the island allowed her to reconnect to this memory, allowing her to not to forget the past, but to preserve it and grow from it. We found trace of history, evidence of despair, hopes, and new beginnings. Like this Christ figure, being resurrected off the cross. Today, this residue and remnants are gone, clear out and clean up. And while waiting for asylum, one could only dream of a new life. In this case, posters of, of cars were very symbolic. One poster was intact and the other was torn up. As refugees, we were unsure of what type of future awaits us. And mythological stories and legends were created. And one was about a spirit named Father Bidon, who saved people um, from drowning and watched over their dire boat journey. Families would dedicate plaques to old Father Bidon. And one of the plaques from a Cambodian family speaks about Thanksgiving, a tradition we celebrate to give thanks in our lives. And for me, it conjures up stories of the pilgrims, I would say one of, of America's first boat people. In this photo, we came upon a few of ephemeral documents, and these were letters, written testimonies, and governmental records. Some were probably buried in the dirt while, with plants growing through them. Others were scattered throughout the abandoned buildings, and these letters were left there waiting for someone to pick them up. So mom and I collect as many as we could carry off the island. As people who had to leave everything, we knew that we knew that these letters were precious because they contained people's testimony, stories as to why they left as part of their asylum application. For example, we found an item called a boat sheet. A boat sheet was a census of the number of people on a boat conducted when the boat were, was rescued. On this form, an officer wrote, 22 people die on the sea by Thai, which means t pirates murder 22 people. Refugees escaped with their life savings, so they were prone to pirates. And on this boat, there was only one survivor. Tran Truong was 15 years old when he was rescued on November 3rd, 1986 at three in the morning. 
It was stories like this that hit me, stories like this that left lingering in the landscape waiting to be told. So I was very drawn to these artifacts and the stories they contain. I scanned some of the letters and enlarged the part where the paper was decaying. Here, a worm ate through the paper, leaving layers of missing information. I wonder where the information went. Could it all just disappear? I printed some of these writings onto leaves, suggesting that the content of these documents became part of the natural landscape. And in my imagination, the words and voices echoes throughout the soil, plants, and landscape of the island. In 2011, I was invited by the Sheldon Museum of Art to collaborate with the Vietnamese American community on a project I called Vietnam, Nebraska. Like most immigrants and refugees who came to the United States, those of the first generation want to preserve their ethnic heritage and tradition. Immigrants resettle in Lincoln, Nebraska, carry their cultural tools with them to remake the land into something familiar. Vietnam, Nebraska is about the mixing of the two to be Vietnamese American. What I wanted to achieve in this project was to present a self-portrait of the community. The community is made of many parts, including different generation, religion, and new arrival, as well as those who came to the United States in 1975. And I just love this picture of the Buddhist community of Lincoln. This American craftsman house was converted into Buddhist temple. Now, this is the larger Vietnamese Buddhist temple. And one might imagine that you will find a Buddhist temple like this, this one deep in the mountains of Asia, but it, it is in the Nebraskan landscape. And for many years, the Vietnamese community were fund, was fundraising to build this temple. And their dream came true when one of their members won a mega lottery jackpot. And this image depicts the Asian American seniority group, Sigmund Tsai Zeta, setting up their invasion annual fundraiser banquet, a tongue in cheek on, play on the word invasion. The fears of the foreigner, like the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, or Trump's immigration and refugee gaslighting. While I was researching the history of Nebraska, I came across Solomon Butcher photographs of settlers of the Homestead Act. In these photographs, I saw family units, homes, the landscape, and a sense of prosperity. And since the Butcher photographs were made in Nebraska, it was easy for me to make this historical connection to the present Americans. So I made portraits of families in front of their homes. The faces might change, but the dream is still the same, a place to belong and call home. And this is a photo mural titled Family Story. I didn't want to sh show you just the surface of home, but the history that accumulates there, what took place inside these homes. So with the help of the Students Club at the university, we collected family photographs to construct this mural. And during the exhibit, many people visited, shared stories, and recognized these faces in their community. And at the end of the exhibit, I gave these portraits to the participant. Many expressed that they have been seen in, in this exhibit and, conf and confirmed their sense of belonging. In 2018, I was invited to New Orleans to create a project of the Vietnamese American community. I call this project Zan La. In Vietnamese, San La means green leaves and plenty sprouting out of the rich for fertile soil of the New Orleans area. As a child growing up in California, the camouflage uniform worn by actors in the Vietnam War Hollywood movies haunted me in the innocence of my child's mind. The color green was associated with war, military, death, and Asian orange disfoliation. Later in my adult life, Vietnamese culture greenness was redeemed in my mother's garden, where Asian vegetables were grown to make the delicious Vietnamese meals that nour nourish my sibling and me. 
When I was invited, I was already wondering about what Vietnamese people here grow that the, given that the climate is humid, subtropical, similar to what you will find in Southeast Asia. This is a community garden called Veggie Farm set up so the Vietnamese seniors can make a living in their retirement years. I marvel at what I saw in these gardens, hanging winter melons, elephant ear stalk, red tide chilies, okra, bitter melons, and lemongrass. The lemongrass is significant as it was one of my first earliest childhood memories. I recall my siblings carrying me as my family and I gathered wild lemongrass growing along the highway in our, our first few weeks in America until a neighbor informed us that we should not do that. It was a survivor skill we carried when we left the refugee camp in Malaysia, where gathering and fishing were to supplies the ration the UN Refugee Agen Agency gave. The garden portrait represents the Vietnamese community's strength and the immigrant, Im immigrant's ability to adapt to their new home. Many participants expressed that they care for a garden to watch it blossom, nothing more and nothing less. It gives them peace of mind to connect to the land and air. Vietnamese Americans in the Gulf state do live under the pressure of white supremacy, as you can read in these headlines. The war between Vietnamese fishermen and the KKK signal a new type of white supremacy. Decades after clashing with the Klan, a thriving Vietnamese community in Texas. As a child, Yosemite only exists in my imagination as I saw image in photo books, such as those by Ansel Adam. One day while browsing through a photographic trade show, I found a tin type of three Chinese men posing in front of a studio backdrop depicting a forest scene. This image made me wonder how the Asian body fits in, into the American landscape. During the California gold rush, Chinese labor laid the railroad tracks and dug the mines to the gold field, but many of those depictions were written out of mainstream history. Around this time, I have been making daguerreotypes, a 19th century photographic process in which the image appears floating on a silver mirror plate. Daguerreotypes are known as mirrors with memories. It was a mirror held up to your face and remembers your likeness. Making daguerreotypes of the National Park is a way to insert my viewers into the landscape as a form of citizenship, as saying that you belong here. Along the way, my daguerreotype provokes questions of politics, landscapes, and history about our current moment. This is the artist Branham Ng, a past graduate student of mine, who is, reflective, who is reflected in the Roosevelt Arch at the north entrance to Yellowstone. I waited several hours for the sun to illuminate the quote above the entrance. The top of the arch is inscribed with a quote from the Organic Act of 1872, the legislation that created Yellowstone as the war's first National Park, signed by President Ulysses S. Grant, for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. You might notice that the quote is backward because the daguerreotype records the scene as a mirror image. The arch was, was not originally intended to honor Roosevelt, still he was so named because the president was vacationing in the area during the arch construction and was asked to speak at the de dedicated ceremony. He helped, the he helped lay the arch cornerstone and gave a speech to 2,000 people who attended the ceremony. He said, Yellowstone Park is something absolutely unique in the world. This park was created and is now administrated for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. And he added, it is the property of Uncle Sam and therefore of us all. 
It is the property of Uncle Sam. It's the part that gives me chill. Although, yes, this place needs to be protected, but is done at the removal of the indigenous community. Today, daguerreotypes are obsolete as a form of commercial photography. In that way, they are truly an art form. The daguerreotype does not represent reality the way we see it. Since the plate that goes into the camera is the actual photograph, you would get a one-of-a-kind photographic object that is richly high resolution. The silver crystal produced prismatic colors that shifts between blues and pink. While photographing the park, I base my composition on my memories of those early photographs I have seen, like those by the 19th century photographer Carlton Watkins and Edward Moybridge, and 20th century photographers like Ansel Adams and many other who came before me. They define these natural, national spaces for us. After the American Civil War, Many landscape photographers working for the Matthew Brady studio in DC began publishing photographs of the war. And for the first time, the public could see the carnage of a nation divided. But those photos were, were not well received by the public. People wanted to avoid facing the reality of war. But then a different types of photographs had begun circulating from photographers in the West and made their ways to Washington, DC. The Carlton Watkins Yosemite photographs sparked, sparked Abraham Lincoln in 1864 to sign legislation giving Yosemite Valley to the state of California. And I quote, upon the expression condition that the premise shall be held for public use, resort, and recreation. And this set the stage for the creation of the National Park Service. Historical sites are my favorites to visit as they inform the public about our history. This ob obelisk is at Manzanar Historical Site near Death Valley where Japanese nationalists and Japanese Americans were imprisoned during World War II. This is a replica of Fat Man, the plutonium bomb that was dropped on the Japanese city of Nagasaki in August 9, 1945. Daguerreotypes takes a minute or two to record an exposure. So anything that moves tends to dissolve, like this family standing there in front of the, the bomb. And this is at Joshua Tree, where thousands of years ago, a boulder lodged itself into this rock. And in this picture, I'm thinking about balance. It's so important, how does this country continue to balance itself? That's the meaning of the national park system. It's like this perfect thing we're trying to achieve. I'm gonna show you one last body of work here. This body of work is called, All I'm Asking For Is My Body. It is a new daguerreotype project. This series is inspired by Mitin Murayami novel with the same title, which was required reading in one of my Asian American study course here. The story is about a second generation Japanese and American boy who grew up in, in a 1930s Hawaiian sugar cane worker camps. The novels explore pride, poverty, plantation life, and individualism. In this series, I collected photographs of plantation workers produced in the late 1900s and early 20th century. These photographs depict the laborers on the plantation, and some depict the plantation owners overseeing the crops and workers. In viewing these images, we see the lives of those who labor and harvest these cash crop, creating wealth for the colonizer who exploit the land economically and rarely share the profit with those workers, as in the case of slavery. In making daguerreotypes on silverware platters, I inverse the imperial glaze and reveal how colonizer wealth is rooted in the plantation system. All I'm asking for is my body recalls our attention to acknowledge this history, 
the bodies that work the land, their self-autonomy aspiration, and the accumulation of wealth by those individual, corporation, institution, university, and today's empires. I titled this work based on the caption I found on the stereograph, like picking cotton on a grape plantation in North Carolina. And I just want to show you a quick video here of the work on display, as you can see on this silver platter, and the unique characteristic of the daguerreotype of process as a reflective image here. This is a Chinese house servants. And this is tea gathering in Shilong, now known as Sri Lanka. Cotton field in Atlanta, Georgia. And I would like to, I want to finish with this collage titled Two Brothers and a Mom. Picture here is my mom carrying my brother and me in a refugee camp. And one of my favorite rock formation in Yosemite Valley is called Three Brothers. It is reflected in the waters of the Merced Rivers during the late summer season. In 1851, the Mariposa Battalion for, named this formation Three Brother after the capture of the three sons of Chief Tanaya near the base of a rock. The Mariposa Battalion was again formed in 1851 to defeat the Awanaji and Chachili in the California genocide. The United States government, California state government, and non-Indigenous settler implement policy of displacements, displacement, forced removal, and genocides of Native, Native American tribes during this period. A hundred years later, in 1955, the Vietnam War started. War-torn consequence of refugees fleeing is imbued in our landscape far and near. So thank you. And then we could take some questions for the audience. Yay. Professor Don, that was so good. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh my gosh. That Thank was so, so beautiful. Um, while, while you all are thinking about your questions, I'll give you a moment to kind of think through and we'll definitely want to take some questions from the audience. We'll also be taking some questions from, um, from the online space, but something that occurs to me just to, to say, uh, first of all, that that was just such a, an incredible presentation it was incredibly moving. <laughs> um, and just that it's the, 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 the thinking space that you move through, um, as part of your process and your part of your understanding of the work. The, the question that comes to me is, what, what do you think about the role of beauty in your work? And, and how, does, how does beauty function in the work that you create? Um, yeah, you know, I, um, like all artists, I think we use beauty in a way to attract people to the object, to the painting or the photograph. And of course, beauty is very subjective too, but it allows people to come into the work and to um, just to understand, even the subject matter can be um, something that's dark, like like history of war. But then once you get past that and you start to look into the work, then you start to understand, um, you know, these these other information that we the artist wants you to present. You know, I find like we we watch movies. You know, we want to see things that move us, and I think that's artists try to do best with beauty is is to move people. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you for bringing us into your work in this way and all the different layers. Um, how about our, our friends out here? Is anyone sitting with a question uh, or response, something that they're thinking about? Wonderful. I'll just come right over. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering what the actual process is for printing pictures on leaves. Yeah, yeah, and that's so. So that's a process that actually sort of developed here at San Jose State. Um, 
Well, it's really simple. What you do is you have a transparency. So you could print a transparency, maybe like an overhead projector. People remember those back in the days um, here. But what you have is an overhead projector, and you place that on a, on a leaf that you just pluck. And you, and you want to put that in something called a contact printing frame. But basically what it is, is just like a picture frame with a sh sheet of glass. So you have a, the, the pressure of the glass and the transparency can, um, and the leaves push together. And then you just expose that to the sunlight for about several hours, about a day or two. And then the sunlight will bleach out the chlorophyll. And it's just a, a property that happens. And then afterward, in, in the way I make chlorophyll prints, I dry them and I cast them in, in resin. So that was uh, my, my, as I think I mentioned, my, my BFA work when I was a student here. Yeah, and it's very easy to do. I encourage everyone to try it, especially as this spring and summer approach. Great time to do chlorophyll printing. That was a great question. Thank you for asking about that. Yeah, I have a comment and a question. Um, it actually kind of feeds off uh, the question about um, process, but early one of your earlier one of your photographs was the boulder that had fallen and you were talking about balance. And I think that actually kind of reflects your work because you have the cultural interest, but also you're balancing it with a very interesting appreciate or an appreciation of the history of photography. So you're balancing two things right there as well. And I, I feel from your work, you have the passion for both. So it's more a comment than a question, but very fascinating. Your, the cultural aspect and, and then your technical approach to it. So, oh, th thank you so much. Sure. Thanks for the comment. Coming right over here. Thank you. So, as a Vietnamese American, the narratives in your photographs, um, they really speak to me and they're very familiar to me. And so, thank you so much for telling our stories. Um, and I'll, not, I'll try not to cry when I say that, but it's very moving for me. Um, my question to you is, um, do you consider yourself a Vietnamese poet, a Vietnamese, write, a Vietnamese writer, a Vietnamese artist? And if so, how is your Vietnamese expressed? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, if you see my, sometimes at museums, they have like a label on the wall. Sometimes, you know, sometimes they have Vietnamese American artists, you know? But I, I, I mean, I see myself as that hyph hyphenated person um, because most of my experience is here in, in the U.S. So I, I always try to include that American part. If, if I'm understanding your question, you know, Vietnamese artists, one might think is an artist who is from Vietnam, right? All, you know, even though I was born in Vietnam, but I was I came here as a country. So most most of my experience is actually here as an American, and that's also very tricky um, territory too. Is like for Asian American artists, like when do we when do we lose <laughs> that Asian part of it? When when do we just become American artists? You know, and and it's of course you know during this period of the pandemic and attack on Asian American. You know, we're trying to sort of figure out our space in this sun, this country, you know, like where do we sort of fit in? And of course, a, lo a lot of the work that I'm focusing on these days are sort of thinking about that sense of belonging, you know, um, and, and you know, we we belong, but it's like, it's always having to be, be proven, right? Depending where, where you go within this country. Yeah, yeah, yeah any, any Great, here's another one. Hi, thank you so much. That was so interesting. Um, what's next for you? What kind of projects are you working on now or in, in the plan yeah. to work on? Oh, well, you know, a lot of projects as an artist, you always have multiple projects happening at the same time. I, I imagine if you're a researcher or writer who's who's doing a lot of multiple things too. Um, well, for in the near future, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I just received my sabbatical for the fall. And um, my proposal is to um, travel to New Orleans again to do a daguerreotype project of, of the city itself. And this is gonna be in collaboration with the New Orleans Museum of Art. And so I will, will head out there, work for several weeks, and then come up with a body of work. And then, in, and then they'll hopefully plan to, plan to exhibit the work. Yeah. Wonderful. And there's another question up, um, 
on the board that has to do with daguerreotype. And I'm wondering if I can frame it and kind of connect it as the screen flickers in an interesting way. I'm wondering if I can kind of connect it to a broader question about photography as a medium. Mm. So you talked quite a bit throughout your presentation about a kind of tension between preservation and decomposition. And you return again and again in such a beautiful way to this decomposition. So I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about that, sort of your choice of photography as a medium and then what attracts you to, let's say, decomposition in particular? Yeah, you know, so as I mentioned, when I was growing up, um, there's, I was surrounded with the image of the Vietnam War, you know, through the movies or through the archives. And of course, when I came to this country, my family didn't carry any photographs with them at all. I, there, I have like, no pictures of Vietnam. Uh, it wasn't until later when I went back to Vietnam met my grandmother that she gave me some pictures of my family, you know. Um, so photography seems to like that photographic image is always something that I kind of um, grew up with and it became part of like my identity. I mean, in a way it was like when I was a kid working at my my um, parents' TV repair shop, it, using photography or looking at photography was a way to escape, you know. And I, we would get these calendars in the mail of like, um, park scenes of green spaces or national park. And I always wanted to like dream going to them, but my family never really, you know, we didn't go out and camp and, you know, I wouldn't, didn't have that experience growing up as a kid. And I always thought about like camping as the most American thing you do, you know, as a family. So it wasn't until later on as an adult that I went, I went camping um, or actually I went, so pretty much went out there with a, with a camera. But decomposition is really interesting too, because um, you know, photography, it's the 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 analog photography, like the stuff we keep in, like the pictures we keep in our shoe boxes, if you put it that way, they they do fade, they they do change, they go missing, people throw them away, you know, you see all these pictures. So that to me is very fascinating to think about. And I, I always think about this quote from an artist named Christian Bertinsky, a French artist who mentioned like you die twice. You die when you actually die and you die again when someone picks up a picture, a picture of you and don't know who you are, right? And so, and the nature of a photograph, um, given that it, even it's like digital photograph is that it corrupt as in a decay and changes. Like, you know, digital files actually are not archival at all because, you know, the, the the digital dark age, you know, it's the files changes and then you need to um, convert them to other files. And we don't all, we don't practice that enough, but just pictures themselves um, fade too. So for example, I did this project in Lafayette, uh, California of a memorial site um, of, of, of uh, Iraq, um, the, of the Iraq war of, of, of uh, crosses on a field site. And I, and I will visit these crosses um, throughout the years and there'll be pictures on them. And, and every time I visit, the pictures just faded. It just changed, it becomes these white boxes. So yeah, I think photography is just sort of like, it helps us remember, but then it also forgets. And that pro process of also remembering is also a process of forgetting too. And that kind of goes hand in hand. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much, Professor Don. He's fantastic. I want to ask you about the photographs you're taking of Yosemite and other areas. And it sounds like a lot of the thought that you put into the projects that you have is thinking about reinterpretation or reappropriation of previous photography, right? So can you tell me a little bit, help me understand what you're doing with Ansel Adams. What do you see in the Ansel Adams photography? And do you see yourself as reinterpreting that through your own photography? And if so, then what is the, what is it that needs to be reinterpreted? And then maybe it's talking a little bit about the last image you showed us as well about, um, your own interpretation that's introduced through your own photography 
of those same areas. Does the question make sense? Yeah, uh, yeah, it does. You know, um, so the the one thing is, um, and and by the way, there's a photo faculty show up right now in the art building where you can actually see um, some of my daguerreotypes on display of another project I did in Salinas Chinatown that I didn't show today. But the one unique thing about the, my process is using the daguerreotype uh, process. <laughs> so once you see a daguerreotype, you actually see yourself in the image. So you, at the moment of seeing that photographic object, which is a one of a kind, you also, um, you're also self-conscious because you actually see yourself. Unlike looking at just pictures on paper or on screen, where you're just looking at the picture. Um, so that allows you to sort of reinterpret the scene, but then the process itself record the scene in a mirror, um, reverse image. So even though you see these pictures that look familiar compositionally, um, but then the composition is different because they're, they're in reverse. So then in your imagination, you like, like most of us, probably see Yosemite in photographs first before going there, or some of us who haven't even been to Yosemite will, will feel like we've been there because we see those photographs, right? Those photographs are like in view in our, our memories. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of playing around with that um, idea of memories of the historical archives in our, in our, in our, in our in my own sort of photographic process with, 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 the, with, with doing this work. And then the other part of it is that, um, so when I was a kid and a college student, I always wanted to go to, to Yosemite Valley too, uh, you know, as, as any student who was trying to find a body of work. But it's very hard to do so because other photographers have done it and done it amazingly like Ansel Adam. So then the photographs by those photographers actually paralyzed me. It didn't allow me to go into the parts. And then also being a person of color, that was not something that I, I do in a way that that was not something that is sort of conditioned to me to go into the park. You know, if it was considered, these, these spaces were considered white spaces. And even today, there are sometimes considered white spaces. And there was white photographers who made these scenes, right? Um, so for me as an adult going into the national park is to sort of interrogate and challenge that. Um, that idea too. And it actually started too when I was a student here at San Jose State. I want to credit San Jose State throughout my whole talk today because when I was in a lecture in my beginning photo class um, by Reed Esterbrook, Esther, Esther he was showing a lecture of landscape photographers and he titled this lecture, White Man with Big Cameras because they have these big view cameras. So he said, like, oh, white man with big cameras. So I was like, oh, that's so interesting. And I was thinking like, oh, maybe someday I could be an Asian guy with a big camera. And here I am right? <laughs> walking around with, with my big camera, so. Yeah, I, I don't know, Jason, if that answered your question, but it's, it's hopefully it's, it's there somewhere. That was a great question and such an interesting conversation. But picking up on this um, question of technology, something that's interesting is you, you go back and you retrieve past technologies that have been discarded, right? So the daguerreotype, no one's using it anymore, yeah. but you are. Uh, the VHS tape, no one's paying any attention, but you're going back, right? People have discarded those uh, the letters and you become fascinated with the letters that you discovered and the wormholes in the letters. So can you talk a little bit about the role of going back and retrieving, you know, using past technologies that no one else is using? Um, and maybe even how how that influences how you teach photography in a, a sort of in a cultural moment when people are always thinking forward, forward, right? Yeah. Discard the old. Yeah. Well, um, so th there's, so as artists, and I think artists are also like historian in ways and, you know, on different levels, but photographers, I think are a historian, because as, as I mentioned, you know, is you're really recording history. Um, and of course, with the with photography itself as a medium, is a very technological medium. I mean, started in 1840 with the daguerreotype process, and all these other processes, you know, that came after that, all that is now obsolete. 
And once something becomes obsolete in in this in society, artists use it to make art with it, like typewriters and whatever it is, VHS um, camcorders, you know. Um, because I think it's it's that's what artists do. We're just so interested in like how do you take this tool of communication and and make make work work with it. Um, so so yeah, so that's sort of one point. The other point is my my role as a teacher here at San Jose State is to teach 19th century processes, as well as many other processes, digital too. Um, and of course, we're going into AI in photography, which is exciting because students are like having really fun with AI technology in their photographic work. Um, but you know, it's it's always interesting, and 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 um, sort of you couldn't predict like what 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 we call a photograph in the future, right? Is it even on a screen anymore? Is it actually in our mind, right? That's actually a photograph or is it something we wear on, in our head? So all that is always so exciting to, to teach photography and to, and to be in this moment, and especially for students um, coming in and not knowing about film photography and not knowing that they could actually mix up chemistry and make their own photographic prints. And this is what we do this semester. So for them to also dive into that, that, that technology, they start to appreciate the, the role of photography in society because we're so around it for, with photograph, but we're, the visual literacy is so bad in this country. Like we cannot understand how it works, how it behaves, it, it changes us. But once we understand those, we were able to you know, actually use it to our, our sort of benefit. So I kind of try to talk about that in my class. Yes. Leslie, how are we doing online? Do we have any online questions? We've got a few and no worries. If we can't get to them in the next three minutes, we will send you the questions, Ben, and you can respond upon your leisure. But one from Nash, in building and preserving physical archive, what is your philosophy behind creating artifacts that are inevitably decays, ages and fades over time? Oh, that's an interesting question. I, I think, well, um, you know, artists use so many different materials. And I think um, a number of us try to use materials that are archival. But as we all know, nothing is really archival. But I think what happened is that um, these days, artists from even early on, you know, they could be known artists or they could be just artists known in their city in their community that they're also thinking about their archive like what to do with this work you know where to where does it go after we leave this planet you know so that's one thing i'm sort of thinking about these days too because i just you know as an artist you just accumulate a lot of work and yet to think about your own your own um, um archives one more question oh, okay <laughs> This is the plug question from Neil. Incredible. Any current or upcoming exhibits locally where we can engage with your work? This is the time to plug yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will plug myself, which I really do. But definitely at San Jose State, we have a faculty show that's up to the end of the semester in the art building. Um, and I also have a one piece uh, at the San Francisco, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And if you're in the LA area at Rose Gallery in Santa Monica on April 20th, I will be having a solo show down there and that will be the opening. And I'll be in, in conversation with J James Gantz at the Getty uh, Center for the Art, uh, yeah, Getty Museum, um, so. So exciting. Well, can I ask everyone to um, share our, uh, our gratitude and our applause with Professor Ben Don? Thank you so much. And I just want to say, I highly recommend all of our students come into our art department and take our classes. So Absolutely. Great. Yeah, that's the best. That's the great plug. Um, thanks again to everyone for joining us. And please remember that the next University Scholar Series will be on April 10th from 12 to 1, virtual only, featuring Dr. Shayan Shams, Department of Data Science who will be giving an exciting talk about artificial intelligence. Great segue from our conversation today. And data science and healthcare. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.